Hello and welcome to Mickeyology, where we take Disney movies a little bit too seriously in an ongoing attempt to trace them back to their most likely historical settings. I'm Austin Rathall, professional history teacher and lifelong Disney devotee. Today we examine a movie about the most famous historical character who may not have been a real historical character, King Arthur. In this version of the Arthur legend, Arthur is a young boy gaining his education, doing his chores, and dealing with the most rapidly changing voice in the history of puberty. Jumping hard toad! What's that thing up there? Oh, what'll I do? Let's take a look at the magical medieval world of the Sword in the Stone. Clue number one, exposition. Like other classic Disney animated features, The Sword in the Stone begins with a storybook. Then a minstrel-esque narrator delivers the exposition for the story to come. Our narrator sings these words. A legend is sung of when England was young and knights were brave and bold. The good king had died and no one could decide who was rightful heir to the throne. It seemed that the land would be torn by war or saved by a miracle alone, and that miracle appeared in London town, the sword in the stone. Later he says, Though many tried for the sword with all their strength, none could move the sword nor stir it. So the miracle had not worked. This was a dark age, without law and without order. Men lived in fear of one another. For the strong preyed upon the weak. This tells us that the movie takes place in England, specifically near London. That's no surprise, since this is a King Arthur story after all. However, the film's temporal setting is a lot harder to pin down, thanks to one particular character. I happen to be a wizard, a soothsayer, a prognosticator. I have the power to see into the future, centuries into the future. I've even been there, lad, and I've seen all these things. Merlin's time traveling makes room for a lot of anachronisms. We can't consider any of his belongings historical artifacts, and we can't take everything he says at face value, historically speaking. Instead, we must rely on other clues, like the opening exposition. So what does the exposition tell us about the movie's temporal setting? Well, the narrator says this is a time when knights were brave and bold. He says the good king had died, and that this is a time without law and order when the strong prey upon the weak. Therefore, we need to find a time in English history where there was a succession crisis followed by a sort of dark age. That's a start, but England has a long history, and if we want to identify exactly when the movie takes place, We'll need a few more clues. Clue number two, arms, armor, and castles. Wart lives in a world of knights, and his fondest dream is to become a squire. Since the trappings of knighthood evolved over time, the weapons and castles used by knights in the film can hint at the film's period. First, let's look at armor. The knights in Sword in the Stone were mostly simple looking armor probably because animators didn't want to spend hours drawing elaborate suits of armor over and over. The simplicity of the armor puts the movie on the earlier side of medieval history, since armor tended to get more complex as time went on. Sir Kay's armor consists of a breastplate, an outfit of what I'm assuming is chainmail, and a helmet. This armor resembles the armor knights wore in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries before they adopted plate armor. The most inconsistent piece of armor in the movie is the helmet. Characters' helmets run the gamut, from the conical helmets common in the 10th century to the visored helmets common in the 16th century. Merlin even finds one of these visored helmets in the moat during the fish sequence. 
but since the rest of the armor we see is from an earlier period, we can probably call the helmets anachronistic and leave it at that. Although knights did begin wearing enclosed helmets like Sir Kay's training helm, beginning in the late 12th century. The swords knights use in the film are also quite simple, and resemble swords of the 11th through 15th centuries. Sir Ector's castle, where Wart lives, also resembles castles of the earlier Middle Ages. Unlike other medieval castles, though, Ector's castle appears to lack protective walls. Instead, a moat surrounds the castle. Now that feature, along with its mix of square and round towers, makes it resemble Bodium Castle, which was built by Sir Edward Dallinridge in the 14th century. At the very least, we know that Ector's castle is no older than the 12th century, since that is when designers started to incorporate round towers into castles. All this means that the movie must take place sometime between the 11th and 16th centuries, though probably closer to the 11th. Clue number three, tournaments. The most iconic chapter of the movie begins when Arthur attends the New Year's tournament as Kay's squire and witnesses real knights jousting. The first jousting tournament we know of took place in 1066. Early tournaments were basically organized battles where contestants competed with real weapons. Knights would compete in these mock battles, called melees, and two teams of knights fought each other in a brutal free-for-all. The goal was to unhorse your opponent, after which winners were allowed to strip losers of their horses, armor, and valuables. Some knights even brought along assistants who would wait until their lord had unhorsed his opponent and then beat the fallen man with a club so their lord could strip him of his possessions more easily. By the year 1300, tournaments were safer. There were more rules and knights competed with blunted weapons. In the 15th century, they also introduced a barrier called a tilt that would keep jousting knights from colliding. The tournament Wart attends appears to be a pretty orderly affair. There's one-on-one -on -one contests between knights. We see jousting, but no melee. It's impossible to tell whether these knights are using blunted weapons or not, but we can tell that there's no barrier between the jousters. This tells us that the New Year's tournament probably takes place between 1300 and 1400, although we don't see much of the competition, so it's hard to tell. Clue number four, dialogue. Key lines of dialogue throughout the film provide other clues as to when it takes place. For example, Merlin says, Oh, big news, eh? Hmm. I can't wait for the London Times. First edition won't be out for at least uh, 1,200 years. He is presumably referring to the newspaper The Times of London, founded by John Walter in 1785. If we subtract 1200 from 1785, that puts Merlin sometime around the year 585. That would mean the movie takes place during the British Dark Ages. Interestingly, this is the time when the mythical King Arthur was supposed to have lived, leading his forces against the invading Saxons. However, this simply does not jive with the rest of the movie's aesthetic, which animators clearly modeled on the High Middle Ages. So, maybe... Merlin got his dates wrong. Or maybe he's referring to another Times of London, or London Times, that has yet to be published. Sir Ector refers to Christmas at one point in the film, and the earliest reference to Christmas comes from the year 1038. Yet another reason why this movie must take place after the Dark Ages. When Merlin first meets Arthur, he offers him tea with sugar. Now, sugar did not arrive in Europe until the early 12th century, but Arthur appears to know what it is without Merlin telling him. This suggests that the movie takes place during or after the 12th century. Lastly, there's the scene where an angry Merlin sends himself to Bermuda. Oh, above all the idiotic guy, blow me to Bermuda! Where, where did he go? To Bermuda, I suppose. Where's that? Oh, an island way off somewhere that hasn't been discovered yet. Bermuda was discovered by the Spanish in the 16th century, placing the movie sometime before that. With all this in mind, we can assume that the movie takes place between the early 1100s and the late 1400s. Now that we've narrowed our search to those centuries, 
we need to look through the history of them and find an English succession crisis followed by a dark time in which Arthur's story fits. There are three possible candidates. First is the succession crisis of the late 12th century, when Richard the Lionheart went off on a crusade, leaving his throne vulnerable to his scheming brother, Prince John. Prince John's chief rival for the throne was Richard's young heir, named Arthur. This period is a tantalizing candidate not only because it involves a real young heir named Arthur, but because it would mean Disney's Arthur is the rival of Prince John, the villain of Disney's Robin Hood. However, this crisis did not last very long, and King Richard ended up making John his rightful heir anyway, so this candidate is not the best choice. The next candidate is the succession crisis of the late 11th century. King Edward the Confessor was, by all accounts, a very good king. He even became a national saint of England. However, before he died in 1066, he named two different people as his successor, which led to a fight for the throne. This led William, Duke of Normandy, to invade England and fight until he was the only heir left alive, and he became king in December 1066. This period does not work much better than the other as a setting for Sword in the Stone. The crisis only lasted about a year, so the sword in the stone would not have much time to lay forgotten in that churchyard, and the throne would not be vacant long enough for Arthur to claim it. The best candidate, I think, is the crisis of the early 12th century. Henry I died in December 1135, leaving his unpopular daughter Matilda as his heir. But since none of the nobles liked Matilda very much, they wanted Henry's nephew Theobald to be king. But Theobald's brother Stephen decided to seize the crown himself. After all this drama subsided, King Stephen began to rule England and turned out to be terrible at it. Eventually, Stephen lost control of the country and England entered a period called the Anarchy, in which nobles and clergymen acted independently with no respect for the government. This period lasted almost 20 years. A 12th century history book called The Deeds of Stephen says that during the anarchy, England became, quote, a haunt of strife, a training ground of disorder, and a teacher of every kind of rebellion. Another writer of the time said, quote, I have neither the ability nor the power to tell all the horrors nor all the torments they inflicted upon wretched people in this country. Everyone robbed somebody else if he had the greater power. These descriptions fit perfectly with the film's exposition. The anarchy was certainly a time when the strong preyed upon the weak, and it was a time when England needed a miracle to restore the rule of law. It's important to realize that there probably was no real King Arthur, at least not the character we're familiar with from legends. The reign of Arthur is going to overlap with a real monarchy no matter where on the timeline we place it. The Sword in the Stone, therefore, is a kind of alternate telling of history, a story of how England might have been different if a boy educated by a wizard and raised in a dingy castle had pulled a magic sword from an anvil. And with that in mind, I believe the anarchy is the best fit. When we are watching this movie, I believe that when Arthur pulls that sword from the stone, he is ending the anarchy and uniting England once more. Conclusion Based on the movie's aesthetic, exposition, and dialogue, I am placing the Sword in the Stone near London, England, circa 1153 CE. So, what do you think of my conclusions? Do you think I got the date for Sword in the Stone correct, or do you think there's another date that works better? Let me know in the comments, and also tell me which Disney movie you would like me to analyze next. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. If you would like to learn the history behind some of your other favorite Disney movies, be sure to check out the links right here. And if you would like to subscribe, please click right here.